When 51 New Yorkers in the early 1900s got violently ill and three of them passed away, people started to panic. It was eventually discovered that the victims could all be traced back to an Irish immigrant and house cook named Mary. So was Mary poisoning them, or was this just a freaky coincidence? Mary Mallon was born in Ireland in 1869. She moved to the US as a teenager. She worked for super wealthy families in various positions, but eventually landed a good job as a cook. Now, being a cook like that back in the day was one of the best positions you could have in domestic service. People who worked those jobs were nicknamed Queen of the Castle. This is because the cooks got to run the whole show in the kitchen. They managed the kitchen staff, bought ingredients and supplies, and could even go by a hoity-toity name if they wanted to. For Mary, she played it modestly and liked to be called Miss Mallon. Her most popular dish was peach ice cream. Mary worked in the super swanky parts of Manhattan, but she had a hard time holding one job for long. Between 1900 and 1907, she went through seven to eight jobs working for different households as a cook. This is because the family she worked for kept getting sick and some of them even passed away. As the people around her started dropping like flies, Mary would just leave that family and find another one to work for. But every time she'd find new employers, they too would fall ill. Hmm, is Mary one of those secret cyanide poisoners? it would be super easy for her to slip a little something in their food since she cooked for them all the time. Except all of the people that got sick around Mary were diagnosed with typhoid fever. They didn't have any trace of toxins in their system that we know of. In 1906, Mary worked for a rich New York banker named Charles Henry Warren. Over the summer, Charles visited a place on the coast of Long Island and brought Mary with him as a cook. 11 people were staying at the house in total, and from the period of August 27th to September 6th, six of the 11 people came down with typhoid fever. So before we get too far into the story, let me give you a quick rundown of what typhoid fever is and how it was received in society back then. Typhoid fever is a bacterial infection that is most commonly spread through food and drink contaminated with salmonella. The symptoms include fever, nausea, diarrhea, delirium, and before antibiotics were developed for it, death wasn't off the table either. Typhoid fever was pretty common in New York, especially in overcrowded slums where sanitation wasn't a top priority. Five Points, Prospect Hill, and the Hell's Kitchen are a few of the typhoid hotspots from Mary's era. At the time, 10% of cases were fatal and no one was really able to trace the illness back to a specific carrier, but it was believed that the carriers had to be symptomatic themselves. When Richie Rich Charles and his crew started to come down with typhoid fever, they were not about it. These people were shook that they could contract this sickness being rich and well-groomed. So that's when Charles decided to hire a sanitary engineer named George to try and get down to the bottom of how they got typhoid fever. During his investigation, George talked to the sick people as well as Mary. He first thought freshwater clams could have been the cause of the infections, but not everyone who ate the clams got sick. In March of 1907, George started to follow Mary more closely. Uh, let me be real about it, he was stalking her for sure. He monitored her activity and determined she was the one giving all these people typhoid fever. George called her a healthy carrier. During his research, George concluded at least 22 people showed signs of being infected, and it is said that three of them lost their lives. Once George came up with this theory, he knew he had to find a way to prove it, so he literally approached Mary and asked for urine and feces samples. When he asked Mary, she apparently charged at George with a carving fork, so George had to call for backup. Dr. S. Josephine Baker, who was a big advocate for hygiene and the first woman to earn a doctorate in public health, talked to Mary and tried to convince her to give over samples, but she was also chased off like George. Dr. Baker knew how intense typhoid fever was because her father passed away from it. She dedicated her career to helping people prevent illnesses like typhoid fever, but sadly could never get through to Mary. Dr. Baker later wrote, it was Mary's tragedy that she could not trust us. After the two failed attempts to get samples from Mary, Dr. Baker had to call in the police to help. Dr. Baker and five police officers ended up escorting, which sounds more like forcing, Mary to the hospital, where she tested positive as a carrier for salmonella. But it seriously took five hours of Mary evading them until they were actually able to test her. Once the results were in, medical professionals tried to explain to Mary that even though she was asymptomatic, she was spreading typhoid fever to everyone around her. But Mary couldn't believe it. At this point though, it was super dangerous for Mary to be running around and spreading the illness because no vaccine or antibiotics had been developed yet, which meant the number of fatal cases was higher. Even though Mary was still in denial, medics had her sent to North Brother Island to Riverside Hospital. They put her in a cottage where they quarantined her. Over the next two years, Mary's stool was tested about three times a week, and 120 out of the 163 samples all came back positive for salmonella. The thing about this all is most people say Mary didn't technically have typhoid fever herself, she was just a salmonella carrier. So when she made something for a family she worked for, the food would sometimes become contaminated with salmonella, probably from not washing her hands well enough. So when people would eat the meals, they'd fall ill. 
According to George's findings, Mary's famous ice cream made with fresh peaches was the biggest culprit. It was a cold dish made with cut up raw peaches, aka prime breeding grounds for bacteria. He said that compared to her hot meals, no better way could be found for a cook to cleanse her hands of microbes and infect a family. When Mary was diagnosed, no one fully explained the situation to her. She was asymptomatic and couldn't understand why these doctors told her she was responsible for getting everyone sick when she felt fine herself. They did tell Mary, however, that the only way they could cure her would be to remove her gallbladder, but Mary turned them down. Even still, doctors gave Mary laxatives, meds for bladder infections, and brewer's yeast, but she continued to test positive for salmonella. Mary was convinced she wasn't a carrier, though. She allegedly sent samples to a private lab in New York for testing, but those samples came back negative. Mary also received terrible treatment in isolation. She had an issue with her eye being paralyzed, and for six months she wasn't allowed to go to an optometrist to get it looked at. The only thing she could do to temporarily solve the issue was wear a bandage over her eye at night. Oh, and those meds I told you the doctors gave her? They were harming her kidneys and I'm sure did other bad things to her body. Mary just had an awful time in confinement. And once people started finding out about the situation, Mary became a huge meme. People nicknamed her Typhoid Mary, which is a character that became popular in cartoons and jokes. Mary wrote a letter to her lawyer in 1909 saying, I have been in fact a peep show for everybody. Even the interns had to come see me and ask about the facts already known to the whole wide world. The tuberculosis men would say, there she is, the kidnapped woman. Dr. Park has me illustrated in Chicago. I wonder how the said Dr. William H. Park would like to be insulted and put in the journal and call him or his wife Typhoid William Park. That same year, Mary tried to sue the New York City Department of Health for wrongful imprisonment. Her case made it to the New York Supreme Court, but her complaint was eventually denied and dismissed. In 1910, almost three years into her quarantine, there was a new health commissioner who determined that disease carriers shouldn't be kept in isolation anymore. He told Mary he'd get her out of the cottage and help her find work, but just said she could never work as a cook again to avoid transmitting the infection to anyone else. Mary was like, all right, cool, just let me go, please. And shortly after that, she was released into the world of free woman. At first, Mary followed the health commissioner's instructions and looked for a job that didn't involve preparing food. She got a job doing other people's laundry, but made $20 a month, which is less than half of what she used to make while cooking. And then at some point, she hurt her arm and the wound got infected, so she couldn't work for like six months. This poor woman was just dealt a bad hand of cards, wasn't she? After a few years of trying to make ends meet, Mary went back to her cooking roots. To hide her real identity, Mary would use the fake last name Brown. She tried getting jobs working privately for families, but no one would hire her, so she pursued cooking careers at restaurants, hotels, and spas. And everywhere she went, people started to come down with typhoid fever. Just like before, Mary would leave a job once someone got sick, so for years, no one found her out. But then she took a job as a cook at Sloan Maternity in Manhattan in 1915. You know, a hospital where there are pregnant women, aka high-risk people who definitely don't need Mary's salmonella anywhere near them. In three months of working at the hospital, Mary is believed to have infected over 25 people with typhoid fever, including doctors and nurses. Two of them ended up passing away from their illnesses. This whole situation is so sad, honestly. It's super frustrating that Mary went back to cooking for people when she was specifically told not to. I know she was probably confused about the whole carrier thing and needed a job to make ends meet, but I don't think it's worth it for other people to lose their lives in the process. So one of the doctors at the hospital Mary worked at reached out to George to come out and investigate. He talked to a few other employees about Mary and took one look at her handwriting and knew this was the typhoid Mary. Once Mary's cover was blown, she escaped. But one day, she took food to a friend in Long Island and was caught by the cops and arrested. On March 27, 1915, Mary was sent back to quarantine on North Brother Island. There, she lived in a private bungalow for the rest of her life. On Christmas morning in 1932, a guy stopped by Mary's place to make a delivery. When he got there, she was paralyzed on the floor. It is believed that Mary had a stroke that caused her paralysis. And sadly, Mary was never able to walk again, so she was sent to the hospital for good. Six years later, in November of 1938, Mary passed away from pneumonia. Before her burial, some people say an autopsy was performed on Mary, where medical examiners determined her salmonella infection lived in her gallstones. So that meant if she agreed to get her gallbladder removed all those years ago, she would have spared many lives and have been able to live out a somewhat normal life compared to the one she lived. But some researchers say this autopsy is just a myth started by the health center to subdue the backlash they received about the way Mary was treated, which we'll get to in a second. Mary was eventually cremated and buried at a cemetery in the Bronx. Only nine people attended her funeral. 
In the end, no one really knows how many people Mary infected. Some say that number is somewhere around 50, with three fatal cases. Others believe it's closer to 120, with five fatal cases. And a few people say Mary was actually responsible for around 50 fatalities. That's the thing with infections like these, especially in the early 1900s. There's no way to tell the exact number, but Mary's case was a big turning point in the way the food industry operated. In 1916, food handlers' licenses were required for those that worked in the food industry. Mary's story was also used to educate people about infections and healthy carriers. Typhoid Mary is believed to be the first documented case of an asymptomatic carrier. And as much as her story raised awareness for infections, she most certainly wasn't the last to be labeled a super spreader. After Mary, there was an Italian immigrant named Tony. He was a carrier who was said to have infected 100 people, five of whom lost their lives. There was another healthy carrier named Alphonse who owned a restaurant and bakery. He, like Mary, knew he was a carrier who shouldn't handle food, but he just couldn't stay out of the kitchen. But unlike Mary, Alphonse was able to live a pretty free life. In fact, it's estimated that there were over 400 healthy carriers of typhoid who were identified by New York authorities. None of them were forced into confinement. So here's where we get to the ethics conversation. Instead of working with Mary and educating her on the intricacies of what it means to be a healthy carrier, the health department basically just locked her up in a home and subjected her to a bunch of testing. All of these doctors had all the time in the world to test Mary, but when it came time to talk to her about the situation, they suddenly had to bounce. Mary became a guinea pig for doctors and a source of great comedy for the press. One of the most common questions posed about Mary's story is this. Was Mary Mallon a symbol of the threat to individual liberty or a necessary sacrifice to public health? Another question I want to know is, do you think Mary is a criminal? I know it sounds a bit crazy, but Mary was specifically told never to cook for people again because she was a threat to her client's health. So since she continued to work as a cook knowing the possibilities, would that make her consciously responsible for those who passed away? I feel like this is a very intricate situation. Mary was an immigrant who faced many hardships in her life. Seemed like she wasn't equipped with the proper knowledge to understand the carrier thing, but at the same time, she was told the basics about her making other people sick, and she was warned to never work as a cook again. Even still, it's so crazy to think she was confined for so many years. 